I'm very excited about this evening. Cliff Enico, who is nationally recognized as a small business expert, both on tax and legal issues, because he is <clears throat> actually a lawyer, although he doesn't like to admit that too easily or often. Um, he is um, actually one of a uh, foremost authority, actually for now for eBay, globally. Um, and he has been working with small businesses for hundreds of years. And I will let him tell you how all, all about himself in a moment, but we're very grateful to have him here. Donna Wurtenbach is actually the um, president and founder of uh, CEDF, which is the Community Economic Development Fund, which is based out of Meriden, is that right? God save your soul that you came all the way down here. Thank you, Donna. Um, she actually is probably one of the foremost authorities on capital funding and actually on micro lending. So she will be, she, I'm very grateful that she's here because she helps us, she will be helping to answer some of your questions um, as well as her own personal opinion with regard to what makes the most, what, what do successful businesses have most in common? And in particular, with her expertise, she can bring to light some very important components, which are is always a huge frustration for all of us small business owners, which is how do I fund some new ideas? Or how do I do a franchise extension? Or how do I just fund my business? And then, of course, one of my favorite people on the face of the planet, sorry, Mike, one of the smartest people I know, is uh, Mike Iserson. Yeah. He is actually a SCORE me. mentor. <laughs> And um, he actually is uh, is the founder and uh, recently has uh, retired, quote unquote. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> from uh, from a business that he started in back in uh, the late '90s called NC3, which is National Co uh, Corporate, Corporate Consultants. Yes, Corporate College Consultants, which is based actually up in Rhode Island, but it was started here in Westport. And um, he has his own very, and has, by the way, run a number of other successful businesses prior to even doing that. So he brings a whole different perspective. Having been a small to medium sized business owner, watched his own business go from incubation to sustainability to actually, you know, amid a fairly good sized organization, which his sons are now running <laughs> with a few other that. people. Um, having said that, and with uh, not too much other ado, oh, other housekeeping. Ladies' room this way, men's room that way. We will do a, a pretty hard, sto um, hard stop at around 7.35 or so. Um, having spoken with these guys on Friday in a conference call all together, which was re reasonably amusing, I might add, um, they have indicated that they would like to actually have you be a part of this process as well. So while we have a full house, and I'm very excited that we do, please be respectful that we want to make sure that we're covering off on everything that they have to say. So if there are important questions that you would like to ask them while we're in the midst of key topics, please don't hesitate to do so, but let's try and keep it to a kind of a minimum. We do want it to be active, interactive and lively, but we also want to make sure we get through all of the material. Lastly, I have to say that there is a gentleman in the audience, um, Derek Sasagi and his wife, Tracy, own a business called My Pet Chicken. They are actually part of our process and uh, part of our mentoring process, and they just made the cover of Entrepreneur Startups. Aren't they cute? And we're very excited about them. So yay, Derek. Very excited. So we're very excited that, that he's part of our, pro our process, and he's actually a testament to someone that has come to a number of our workshops and is involved in our mentoring process and will be continuing to do so. So with that, and without any further ado, we're on to you all. And I'm going to start with you, Mike. All right. Thank you, Dana. For Thank you. Gracious introduction. Um, in 1995, after having spent uh, almost 30 years in the executive recruiting business, uh, I decided to form a company called National Corporate College Consultants. And the mission of this organization was to try to convince major corporations to outsource their college recruiting program. Now, the uniqueness about this was it had never been done before. And everybody told me it couldn't succeed, it would fail. And 17 years later, we're a multi-million dollar business. So I, I get excited when I say that number, right? So. See, I needed a napkin. Yeah, thank you. Anyway. Um, I'm, I'm not going to um, tell you to go to the web pages and look up the 10 reasons to write a business plan or a marketing plan or the 14 reasons to do a whole bunch of other things. What I can do, however, is relate to you my own personal experiences in building this company, uh, how we did it, um, the pitfalls and uh, some of the obstacles that we overcame in doing it, 
and uh, hopefully in, in terms of relating some of that experience to you, uh, I can be a benefit to this conversation. Thanks, Mike. And Donna? I uh, have spent the last 30 years helping small businesses get started and grow in the state of Connecticut. Um, I've seen most businesses that you could possibly see. Uh, what we do is we fill the gaps that most people have a hard time finding answers to, whether it's uh, access to capital, reasonable quality access to capital, whether it's business consulting, small business training, whatever it happens to be. Uh, we are the holistic statewide resource for helping people get started in business and grow their businesses and avoid the pitfalls and hopefully do pain prevention. <coughs> Before I introduce myself, let me just say, for the benefit of, of, of the audience on TV, what you have witnessed here, while it was not planned, is a perfect metaphor for the entrepreneurial life. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the entrepreneurial <laughs> it, it life... a series of spilled coffees. Is what <laughs> and the entrepreneurial life is getting up in front of an audience of people, making just a hideous mistake, but... Recovering quickly, gracefully, gracefully, under pressure, and never taking your eye off the camera. So give Mike a hand for that. that you know he's an entrepreneur because he only he could have pulled something like that off. That, that, that's absolutely true. Well done. Seriously, thank you. My name is Cliff. Try not to think of me as an attorney because otherwise you'll, you'll run screaming out of the room. Uh, I am an attorney, but for most of that time I have worked exclusively with entrepreneurs. I think I have helped somewhere between 15 and 16,000 people uh, start and run businesses of their own of all different kinds. Uh, really, if you want to know more about me, I do have a wonderful website. I'm also a syndicated columnist. I write a weekly column for a creator syndicate. It's called Succeeding in Your Business, kind of like an Ann Landers for business owners. And if you check me out at succeedinginyourbusiness.com, uh, you'll, you'll know more about me than you'll ever want to know. Thank you, Cliff. Okay, um, there are really, um, just a few things that I wanted to say. Um, most, it's, it's a fairly well-known fact that small businesses are the growth and driving engine for this country. Um, having said that, it's also a fairly well-known fact that um, one in every five maybe make it through five years and one in less than one <laughs> make it past the first nine. Um, having said that, there are things that we can all do to ensure that we succeed as opposed to get into that failure rate because it is a critical component. And by the way, that's actually a very important part of what SCORE really is meant to do. Its mission, its vision is really to support the growth engine called the small business in the United States. Having said that, and what this to what the topics obviously for tonight is, what do the success what do small successful businesses have in common? And having said that, I wanted to start with Mike actually. Okay. Um, on I some ran of out of call. <laughs> you want to get to know <laughs> Having said that, I really wanted to get your thoughts first. Okay. On what are the critical success factors first? All right. First, pick the right business. Right? And, and picking the right business is not a function of uh, necessarily looking at what the competition does and what the barriers to entry may be, but what's the right business for you? What, what is it about this business that's going to resonate on a daily basis with you? What's going to get you excited about it? And it has to play to your skill set. Don't do stuff that you're not good at doing, all right? Do things that you're comfortable doing, that you're capable of doing, that you've demonstrated some abilities to do. Um, Secondly, you really got to be passionate about this. I mean, this is, you know, it's not fun and games, right? And, and, and you have to have an attitude that you're on a mission. You're not cutting stone, you're building a cathedral. You want to build something that's going to be viable and lasting. And you've got to be passionate about the effort that you put into it. Lastly, and, and you know, the, the, the factors that you can't control often, time and money. It, it's the killer, okay? Um, you're never going to have enough time to get it off the ground. You're never going to have enough money to sustain it, okay? But if you're passionate about it, if you believe in it, you can pull it off. Um, 
Uh, as a side effect too, um, and uh, I, my wife happens to be in the audience, it really helps if you've got a really good spouse. All right? <laughs> I mean, because you really need that kind of support system in order to be able to understand. You really need the encouragement on a day-to-day -day basis of folks that you're most close to who are going to support your activities in this area. Donna, do you want to comment on that? Well, I think he hit on one of the most important ones, which is passion. If you don't love this, stop now. You're going to have to work 16 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year, and the only thing that's going to make it all worthwhile is that you absolutely love and have passion for what you do. So your business idea should come from your soul instead of coming from some nice magazine that told you the top 10 businesses this year for the United States. Um, the other thing that I find is irreplaceable is drive. <clears throat> you have to have drive. Nobody can give that to you. Nobody can teach it to you. You have to have drive, and that's what's going to get you through the tough times. As for all those wonderful entrepreneurial trait tests that you can take that tell you all the different traits you need, the reality is God didn't make any one of us perfect with every single one of those traits. The important thing is know thyself. Be honest with yourself about what your strengths are. Everybody's, everybody's business needs a balance. So while you need a doer, you need a dreamer. While you need a detail person, you need someone who's the idea creative person. So you need constant balance of lots of different personality traits. The trick is which ones are you strong at and then you find the rest you hire to your weaknesses or partner to your weaknesses so that you have a very good balance of what the business is going to be able to take and then you do what you're good at and you let the other people do what they're good at yeah okay well i think mike and donna have hit on some very very important things but of course being a lawyer i have to be a little bit of a contrarian i think the most important key to success do something that makes money. <laughs> not everything does. No, no, and don't get me wrong. Passion's important. I, I would not disagree with that. But passion alone does not make for a successful business. If you're passionate about doing something and it's not making money, that's called a hobby. And a hobby's great. Don't get me wrong. I think we need hobbies, too. I'm not saying that hobbies are necessarily bad things. But hobbies do not make money. A, a, the IRS has this technical set of regulations about you know, what's, what's a hobby and what's a business, but I think it really boils down to, are you making money at it? If you're making money at it, it's a business, and I think the IRS will even recognize it as a business, whereas if you're having a lot of fun doing it but it's not making money, that's a hobby. You want to be doing something, first of all, that people want to buy. That's important. Uh, if the market isn't there, don't do it. It's that simple. You have to be doing a product or a service that people actually want to buy, and that's in demand. Secondly, you want to be doing something where you can make a decent margin, where you can buy something for one dollar and sell it for three to five dollars, as opposed to buying it for a buck and selling it for a dollar and five cents. Um, that's the second thing, because it's that margin that's going to help you generate cash flow going forward. Uh, and that's very, very important to the success of, of any business. The third thing is you want to find do something where there's not a whole lot of competition. Uh, that's the third thing. Look around your neighborhood and look to do things that are, that are not being done to death by a million other people. Uh, those to me, I mean, there's a lot more, of course, and we'll be talking about that more in the evening, but to me, those are the three essential things. I, I tell eBay sellers all the time, and I, I speak to eBay sellers around the country, it's great to be passionate about, about the stuff that you're selling, but you'll make a lot more money if you're selling st stuff that people really want to buy, there aren't a whole lot of other sellers on eBay, and you can make a ton of money uh, you know, from selling it. You can make a, a thousand percent margin as opposed to a ten percent margin. Uh, if you have a choice between doing something you're passionate about and doing something that's really going to make a lot of money, do the latter. I am not passionate about drafting legal contracts. I don't think any human being on the face of the planet can be, to be passionate about drafting legal contracts, which are dull, boring, technical as the devil. I do it because I can do them in a short period a lot of time, and I can charge lots of money for that. <laughs> Thanks, Cliff. I gotta disagree with the council. <laughs> <God. laughs> you were so you were so well behaved. There. <laughs> um, my greatest personal satisfaction in, in having this business for 17 years were the people that benefited 
from working for this company who came in as trainees and now has significant jobs and responsibilities within the organization. And, and you know, the checks and I's and they're good, but the personal satisfaction to me didn't ever come from there. It, it comes from getting an email or a birthday card from someone I haven't seen in five years who says, thanks for the opportunity to work for the company. Thanks for the training and the experience that you gave me. And that's where I think the real value, to me at least, is. And I think if it's, if it's solely about the money, um, I'm not sure it works. I, th I think there have to be other personal satisfactions in there besides getting the big check. Okay. I, I wouldn't disagree with that, by the way. I mean, there has to be something else that keeps you going for the longest time. Um, it's just you have to understand, I'm in the business, people do not call their attorneys when they're having a nice day. <laughs> that does, We're sorry for the industry you're in. I, I feel that. No, but, but I will tell you, though, it's probably the biggest turn on when somebody calls me and says, you know what, Cliff? You know, you don't remember me, uh, you know, you did something for me 10 years ago, but you know what, I'm successful today, and it was because of you that I'm here today. That, that is the biggest high, so I, I, I am not disagreeing at all, Mike. Okay. Um, Donna, do you have anything to add to what has just been I'm with him. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's with me, that's I'm that. sorry, Cliff. Um, Go ahead. Oh, a minority I view, though. I think lots of... It, People have all different kinds of value systems. For some people, making a lot of money is a high priority. For some people, making a lot of money is not a high priority. For some people, making a difference in the world is a high priority. I think you have to decide what's important to you, where you hang your hat in terms of what your personal value system is, and what you would perceive as the greatest satisfaction out of your business. Uh, for me, the greatest satisfaction out of my business this morning I sat with the governor and one of our businesses and the business owner sat there and said this my dream never would have existed without the community economic development fund uh, they could pay me all the money in the world but if I didn't hear that on a regular basis it wouldn't do it for me and that's just me so I think you part of the soul searching of becoming an entrepreneur is deciding really clearly up front What's important for you? What are your goals and objectives? And where do you want to take this business? Because if you don't have a clear roadmap of where you're going to go, you're not going to get anywhere that's going to make you happy. And what's going to make people happy is different from one person to another. Okay. Thank you for adding. I that. like yours. Thank you. <laughs> um, and it. on that thought, I'm, I'm going to interject a little bit because I, as, as, a, as the moderator and have the opportunity to say this, I kind of agree with all of you, which is me being a facilitator. Um, because the real answer is that um, you wouldn't have gotten the satisfaction of your employees had you not been able to make that money in the first place because they wouldn't be employees because the business would have gone out of business. So to that end, let's talk a little bit about funding and the successes and or the pitfalls. And Donna, I'm going to let you start with that thought. Okay. Um, there is standard wisdom and then there is what's available in today's world which has changed dramatically so let me just quickly walk you through the standard wisdom standard wisdom you fund yourself you nail every family or friend or they used to be a friend or they used to be a member of your family that you can possibly get to and see how many dollars you can pry out of their hands your next step down is you go to the bank right this is where everybody knows you go for funding you go to the bank and if the bank can't fund you because you're a startup or because you're a high risk business, uh, you have minimal experience, your cash flow isn't strong enough, you don't have enough collateral, whatever the five C's are that you don't happen to have in your business, then the banks look at the banks plus some sort of a guarantee program. The SBA has them, the Connecticut Development Authority has them, there's a variety of those available. The misconception in today's world is that that's the end of the story and the only other alternative you have is credit cards. Let me be really clear here. Please don't anyone use credit cards as your basic financing tool. Several years ago, Washington changed the guidelines on credit cards and if you weren't paying attention to this, what you thought you had as a six or an eight percent credit card, one day you get a bill in the mail and all of a sudden you're at 30 percent. 30 percent will kill your business. No business can afford 30 percent debt, nor should you ever have 30 percent debt. So 
no credit cards in today's world. It's okay if you want to go to Staples and put a couple of things on your credit card, but you don't finance a business with credit cards. It is true that getting a loan from a bank in today's world is a lot tougher than it used to be. Um, there are lots of very solid, good business reasons why banks have had to tighten up their access to capital. Uh, what most people are unaware of is that there is an entire, highly sophisticated, well-developed, non-traditional industry that does, that provides the capital and financing for small businesses that do not qualify for bank financing. That's me. So, when you're looking for capital, if you're not going to be able to get capital from your traditional bank for whatever your reason happens to be, you call me and I will all give you all business cards before you leave. There is an entire industry that provides low cost, flexible, small business capital, variety of sizes. What most people have heard about is the micro loan kinds of stuff. Well, this industry will fund up to a quarter of a million dollars in working capital, a half a million dollars in um, commercial real estate or leasehold improvements. It's not just the microenterprise. There is a lot of money out there that's available. The state of Connecticut has recently been involved in putting capital out with outrageously positive terms. Uh, there is plenty of capital out there. So being undercapitalized is nothing more than being unaware of the resources that are available to you. Thank you, Donna. Donna, let me ask you a question. What's your opinion, sure. what's your opinion of crowdfunding? as a way to raise money, as a way to get loans for a small business? Well, I think partially it depends upon how sophisticated the small business owner is. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a very sophisticated small business owner, then you can look at that as an alternative along with investors and other kinds of alternatives. For most businesses, small businesses, especially startups, they don't have the time to put into that. Mm. They need to be able to go somewhere like to a CEDF and say, I need a quarter of a million dollars now in working capital, I need a line of credit, I need a term loan, I need something flexible, and I need it now. I cannot make a lifestyle out of trying to put this stuff together. And there's no reason for you to do that. You should be able to put your hands on capital in very short order in today's world. Can you define what that is, crowdfunding? Okay. There are a number of websites uh, where you basically can ask for money and people can basically bid. I mean, we talk about there's a, when we talk about micro lending. We're talking about something that is actually very relatively new. Uh, there are a number of sites. Prosper.com is one that I happen to be aware of. There's a couple of others too where you can basically put up your business plan or an abbreviated version of it, and people will bid to lend you money, you know, unsecured, you know, the types of loans, usually in very small amounts, fifty dollars. This is not a place to go to raise a quarter of a million dollars, but if you only need about 10, 50, or 20,000, it, it might be uh, of a viable way to go. Mike? Yeah, the, uh, talking about crowdfunding, actually the, the part of the, the act that created this uh, was that companies were going to be able to raise debt and equity using crowdfunding sources, mm -hmm. which is great. The problem is that the SEC has not come out with the regulations as to how it's going to be governed. So right now, crowdfunding is you've got to give something in exchange for the money you're going to get. So if you're in the business of making these things, um, you know, send me $50, I'll send you 50 cups. That, that's currently where it is. But there will be this evolution at some point where you can raise real money, either debt or equity, over the internet. Um, and as a side note, just um, so you know, actually, on March 19th at the Easton Library, we are doing a whole uh, a actual lecture on crowdfunding and uh, patenting intellectual capital with a couple of our other experts that we actually ask. Um, so I'm plugging for the March 19th of the Easton Library. To, um, which, and Mark uh, Noah Tarski is a patent, um, he's, he's a patent agent, and uh, Peter Arturi is actually with Cohen and Wolf up in Danbury, and he is extremely well versed in what uh, Mike is referring to, which is called the Jobs Act, uh, and kind of where the SEC is sitting and how to, how to kind of move around the crowdfunding um, process, which is kind of almost like a bartering. If you get, you can people will loan you money, and you get product because it's a feel-good thing. But it's uh, it's exactly what these uh, what these folks have sort of said. Um, and I agree with Donna. It's not it's not a place to go to, no, and it does not. take and they'll walk you through it. It'll take it takes a fair amount of time. Yes. So is it a Shark Tank kind of uh, of environment where 
they can offer you a particular amount of money and offer you whether or not you want to accept or, or decline particular terms for that money? Is basically, yes. That's, that's mm -hmm. basically that's what it is. And there are sites, Mike is right, the, the SEC is supposed to come down with regulations later this year that will enable crowdfunding where people can actually make investments in companies, like buying stock. Mm -hmm. That does not, you, that is not currently allowed. No. no. Uh, there was an, an, a stat, uh, an act of Congress last year that authorized this, but it's all hinging on SEC rules. I'm right. actually writing a book <laughs> on this right now, and I have like 10 chapters that are totally blank because I can't do anything with them until the SEC hands down their regulations. But there are some sites right now where people will make micro loans to you. And, and that apparently is not barred by the SEC regulations. Like I said, there's Prosper.com, there's one or two others I'm blanking out on some of the names right now. But this is going to be Kickstarter.com, Kickstarter. 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 Yeah. right? That's another one. There are one or two where people are making micro loans to companies. Mm -hmm. And it's true that you bid on terms, you can accept or deny them as you choose. Uh, of course, you then have to keep track of all this. In some cases, you offer people your products and services. Actually, authors are doing this now. When they start a book project, they basically ask because the publishers aren't giving advances anymore. So what they do is they put their publish their book project up on Kickstarter, and people can actually advance them money in exchange for a free copy of the book or autograph once it's okay, published. I have a question for you. Sure. Do you know how this is treated from a tax standpoint? No, nobody does as of yet. But it's no, debt is debt, and I think it's treated the same way well, as... Well, uh, is it going to be treated debt? as income, though? In other words, if, if I get money via the Internet, I don't spend it as an income. Okay, the proceeds, the, the proceeds of a loan are generally not treated as income as <coughs> such. I'm, 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 under, under the current tax code, uh, your interest, of course, will be deductible, but only to the extent actually paid. Yeah. So, so I think the and debt different is industries now. need different kinds of fund funding mechanisms. So you need to look at what kind of an industry you're thinking about going into. You also need to take a look at how sophisticated your knowledge is about negotiating a deal, because negotiating loan agreements, if you don't have any experience in this, can get you into trouble really quickly. So you need to be careful in terms of your industry. Should it be debt? Should it be equity? Is it a line of credit? Is it a term loan? One of the biggest mistakes that people make is they get the wrong product for their business. The other thing that you need to be aware of is that all of the, um, this new form of funding, you're on your own. There's no backup. There's no support. You get the money. You are on your own. The advantage of most of the sources of capital, all the microloan capital, and many of the other sources of capital are that in addition to getting the money, you get a free business consultant that goes along with it who's responsible for watching out for your relationship and managing your debt and making sure that everything is moving along smoothly. So unless you're really sophisticated at this, you're a really good negotiator, and you're not looking for very much money at all, right now is not the time to jump into this, in my opinion. Mm, I would probably agree with that. First of all, I agree with you totally about credit cards, by the way. That, that's a big no, mistake that I think mistake. a lot of early stage uh, companies make, because they think it's the only kind of, they think of it as cheap money, and it isn't cheap it's money not, at all. Let's talk for a second about pitching these people. You know, once you find these people, I always find it very helpful to to find out what their particular hot buttons are. You're going to find that there's no such thing as hot, money comes in different flavors. You're going to, you're going to see this. Uh, an individual investor behaves very differently than a bank who develop who behaves which behaves very differently from a CDEF, a Connecticut Development Agency, uh, which behaves very differently than a micro lender. Um, certain investors behave in certain ways and when you're approaching these people you have to find out what they're looking for what they're looking to get out of their particular investment so for example an individual investor I'm talking here about an angel not friends not family but you know a wealthy individual who makes investments in small companies because he gets his jollies by doing that um, these people generally are not people who are going to fund your light bill and other basic expenses. These are people you don't approach until you have broken even, until you have at least enough revenue from your operations of your business that you can afford to pay your basic operations uh, expenses. I mean, angel investors tell me all the time, I am happy to invest in a growing company to help them get to the next level, but I'm not going to fund the light bill. 
Uh, if they're not making enough, generating enough revenue from their operations to cover at least those basic operating expenses, I'm going to tell them, you know, come back when you grow up. And I'll, I'll do it in a nice way, uh, but I bet they're really not right for me yet. They're not ready for me yet. Some of the Connecticut government agencies, I think, I'm not going to mention names, but their, their primary objective is not to help companies raise money, but to create jobs in the state of Connecticut. So you can have the most brilliant technology company, the most brilliant idea in the world that's going to revolutionize the way we live our lives digitally, but if it's only going to employ three people who probably would otherwise get jobs, the Connecticut development agencies are not going to be really interested in that. They'd much rather have a business that's going to employ 50, 60 low-income people in, in, in an inner city somewhere who will not get jobs somewhere else and take them off the welfare rolls. Now, that's some of them, not all of them. I totally get it's that. Changing. It is changing a little bit, but you have to find out what their hot buttons are, and when you apply for this money, you've got to make sure that you're, that you're giving them you know, what you want. Um, you know, banks, I mean, forgive me, I know your experience with SBA loans, but in my experience... I'm an SBA lender. <laughs> you're an SBA, you are? Yes, we are. You're an SBIC? No, we're an, we're an SBA micro lender. Oh, really? That's mm -hmm. just interesting. Well, not speaking about the micro level, <laughs> but this, if you're going for what's called a Section 7 loan from a bank, 7A. you're not going to be able to do that without putting all of your personal assets at risk. Uh, yes, the loan is technically to your business, but that you, they're going to want you to give personal guarantees, and those personal guarantees are going to be secured by a second, third, or fourth mortgage on your home. So if you don't have equity in your home, a Section 7 loan is going to be tough to get. That doesn't apply to the micro lending program. No, 7A does require collateral. There's no question right. about it. Uh, there's different things you need to think about when you're looking at approaching a lender, whether it's a bank or whether it's a non-traditional lender like ourselves. First of all, walk in prepared. You're going to get one shot at a first impression and only one. You let somebody else write your business plan and you don't know it inside and out and that lender starts asking you questions and you turn into a blank face, you're done. They're investing or making loans to you on the concept that you have the knowledge about this business to really make it successful. You walk in unprepared with a business plan you didn't write and you can't explain your own cash flow and you are dead in the water. So you have to walk in prepared. The second thing is, and the way I always like to explain this is, if you are not prepared, I'm gonna pick up on his point, if you are not prepared to personally guarantee this loan, I don't care who you're borrowing the money from, and if you're not willing to put up any and all collateral that you've got, and that means your wife or your husband has to sign too in many cases, 20% of most owners have to sign personally and put up their collateral. Here's the way it's thought of. Let's say you come to me for a loan. You know you better than I know you. If you don't believe in you and you're not willing to put up your capital, you tell me why I should put up my capital with no backup. That's the way it's perceived. So when you walk in somewhere and they say, you have to personally guarantee this, and you go, well, you know, my wife really isn't in agreement with that, it says to us, you don't believe in this business. You're not going to fight to the end to try and make this business successful. This is a lark. This is not a serious business venture and it will die right there. You kind of have to look a little crazy when you, when you apply for, when you, when you ask for somebody for money. Uh, no, really, it's, it's not so much passion, it's you must really inspire fear in these people. They, you really have to see that if the business doesn't you know, do well, you will do the, you know, the seppuku thing. You'll, 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 you kind of have to convey that image. You can't really come out and say that, but you kind of have to persuade the lender. I just want to say one little addition about, about borrowing money from friends and family, because what we've been talking about so far is borrowing from professional investors, institutional lenders, micro lenders. For a lot of people, the only real money that they can really get when they're first starting out is from friends and family, you know, Uncle Cliff. Whenever you're dealing with friends and family, th there's one thing you've got to keep in mind. Don't treat them like friends and family. If you've got a relative who's going to loan money or make an investment in your company, <coughs> get a lawyer and make sure you do the same legal documentation with that relative that you would do if they were a total stranger, somebody like me. Uh, this is very important. People tend to do things with relatives on a handshake basis, and that can come back and bite you in a very, very big way if things are successful. Um, or if, and let's face it, if things don't work out, 
you got to look at that person over the Thanksgiving dinner table, you know, for the next umpty ump years of your life. There's a lot more going on here than just an investment. But make sure you get proper legal documentation because I've had things happen where Uncle Cliff loans money to a startup business, the business takes off, it becomes successful, uh, the, the entrepreneur goes back and says, hey, Uncle Cliff, here's, you know, here's your money back with, you know, the 10% interest. We, no, wait, 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 oh, 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 oh. This, this, this wasn't a loan. No, 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 I don't want, I don't want your money back. You, you promised me, you know, 10% of the company. Uh, that's what you promised me back then. And, and by the way, I never got my share of stock. My attorney's been bugging me about that. You've got to give me that share of stock that's 10% of a company that now may be worth, you know, a couple million dollars or something like that. And without any documentation, it's your word against Uncle Cliff's. You know, there are bad Uncle Cliff's out there. Um, you know, when, when money is on the table, uh, it, money t changes relationships, uh, I find. And I hate to be, I know I'm a lawyer, I'm paid to be cynical. But, you know, friendly Uncle Cliff, you know, who said, oh, I'll loan you, but I'll, I'll give you this money. Whenever somebody says, I'll give you the money, <laughs> get it in writing. Because I got news for you. They don't intend it as a gift. They intend it either as a loan or as an investment. And you gotta get, you got to be very clear in writing as to exactly what that relationship is. The phrase, never do business with family or friends, got created for a reason. <laughs> in today's world, it used to be 20 years ago, 10 years ago, that family and friends were about the only option you had. In today's world, that is not true anymore. If your non-traditional alternative lenders who should have interest rates about where bank interest rates are, if they are not willing to provide you with startup capital or growth capital, you should be seriously evaluating the viability of your business idea. Because right now, out there, there is capital for most reasonable business startups and growth. If we're turning somebody down, we're also trying to convince them that this is a really bad idea. The market sailed on this before the recession. Your customer who used to buy this in 2006 is not buying this anymore in 2013. Or it's a saturated market or whatever. If your non-traditional lenders aren't funding it, pay attention to that. That should be a huge red flag that, the, that your business needs to be reevaluated in terms of its viability. Hmm. Actually, thank you so much for that for that lead-in because the next question, which I'm going to give to you, Mike, is exactly on that topic. The viability of a business and whether or not somebody's going to loan money against it to you. And there are people out there saying, maybe you should be reevaluating this model. I'd like for you to walk through the construct around being emotionally attached to or not so emotionally attached to a business model and its viability. We've got about 10 <laughs> minutes for a story. I'm going to tell you a story. In um, the year had to be 2002, 2003, we came up with a concept called asynchronous video interviewing. Right? Asynchronous, not at the same time. This is a brilliant idea. What we could do is we could pre, pre, we could record an interview on a computer. Candidate would walk into a room, we use this on college campuses, and we'd get a talking head come up on the computer, and it would ask the candidate questions, and the candidate would hit a button and respond. And it would go question, answer, question, answer, and then finally it would be terminated. Um, we got a proof of concept on this. We went to a, a think tank down in Princeton, New Jersey, and said, there's a brilliant idea. We think we can build it for you. We went through the proof of concept. We went to a patent attorney. The patent attorney said, we think this is an absolutely incredible product. You're going to get a patent on this. All right? So already I'm counting the money. All right? we, 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 we found a partner to build the software for us who had contacts in China to do this. We installed it within a six-month period of time on 26 colleges and universities throughout the United States. In addition to that, we developed a, a, a model for a mobile, a mobile unit that we could ship out to a college and university, and we could have it sent back. Now, the advantage of this product was you didn't have to go to schools anymore if you were in the college recruiting business. And in addition to that, because we could download it to the web, you could review that interview if you were in Des Moines, Iowa, or in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Didn't matter, and you could do it at any time. All right, and the technology would allow you to put up four candidates on a screen and have them all answer the same question so you could evaluate the responses. An absolutely fabulous idea. Failed. Bombed. 
And it bombed because we never figured the market correctly. All right? We never really understood the market. And the market was that people actually enjoyed going to college campuses and interviewing students. So regardless of what our economics were, and regardless of how great our technology was, it wasn't going to work. We developed an absolutely fabulous business plan, 26 pages. I still have copies if you're interested. Um, <laughs> and we had all kinds of venture capitalists and angel investors and people who wanted to do joint ventures with us and everything else. And, and what we missed was this little human element which said that, you know what, I went to the University of Pennsylvania and I like going back and talking to these kids at the University of Pennsylvania and regardless of how dollar efficient this product was and how great this model was, it was never going to work. And there are still people trying to make a market in this business, still isn't working. All right? And so, you know, it's a great example of, a, of kind of a really neat idea that just isn't going to come to fruition. The company ever went bankrupt, we dissolved it because we weren't going to be able to get it to where we wanted it to go. Can I comment on that? Yeah. The reality is when we teach entrepreneurs that are getting ready to start, as much as you love your business, and you have a lot of opinions about your business, et cetera, et cetera, nobody cares what you think about your business or how passionate you are about your business. This is all based on what does your customer think about their business. And the first and most important thing you have to do is get inside the heads of your customers and find out exactly how they think. Why do they buy it? When do they buy it? What are they willing to pay for to buy that service? What are the ancillary benefits that they get from using the existing system instead of the new one that you're trying to promote? My kids had a great time going to college campuses and doing those one-on-one -on -one interviews and would pick up a plethora, one of my favorite words, a plethora of information about that college campus that you could not do without being physically on the campus. Uh, so for each one of you, what's inside the heads of your customers is what is, is critical. Now for those of you who have been in business pre-2008, if you have not done a reality check recently, you need to do one quickly. The mindset of customers in 2007 and the mindset of customers in 2013 is totally different. And you want to make absolutely sure that you are not planning your business based on obsolete market knowledge. Yeah, that's true. To, to <laughs> something, something that Mike, actually, tying into something that Mike said, we have a saying in, in the world of entrepreneurship that it's a business, not a baby. Um, you, you, you can't get too emotionally attached to the way you're doing things because that's how you get complacent and that's how change can, can swamp you and, and knock you for a loop. Uh, during the early to mid 90s, I actually ran a fairly successful, although very small, desktop publishing company. Uh, we were doing career information for lawyers. Uh, we actually did things, programs on how to interview for a legal job. That's actually, I think, how Mike and I first became connected. Uh, we were doing things on how to interview. We actually had a program, believe it or not, we used to do at law schools around the country called People Skills for Lawyers. Can you believe that? <laughs> Teaching lawyers how to market and how to sell themselves to clients and stuff like that. Well, as we got into the late 90s, you know. <laughs> and he's right, too. Uh, he's right. Um, but. As we got into the mid to late 90s, it's kind of funny because you and I were kind of like on the same path with this. We saw the internet coming, and I just said to myself, you know, people aren't going to be spending, buying, spending, you know, 30, 40 bucks for a 200 page paper book on how to interview for a job. There are going to be online solutions for this, and I, I do not have the resources to, to, to bring my business into that world. Uh, I, I mean, I, I would have to spend, I would have to raise like $5 million of capital to develop a product similar to what Mike was doing, you know, for lawyers to help them on interviewing skills and stuff like that. So what I did was I found a buyer for my company and I sold my company uh, to a major publishing company that was doing something similar. And as part of that deal, I signed an agreement where I became a consultant to that company to help them capture the market 
that I had owned myself as a niche publisher, you know, back in the early 90s. So sometimes the best way to succeed in business is to put yourself out of business. Um, you know, if you see that your model is not going to be viable in the next few years, maybe that's a signal that you should sell out and help somebody else take that future, you know, before they come and conquer you and wipe you off the, off the face of the planet. Uh, I, just, okay. I just want to add one thing. It's kind of flying a little bit under the radar here, which I think is critically important, is talk to your customers. I don't care what you're selling, who you're marketing to, talk to them. They will tell you what direction to take your business. I mean, feedback is a gift, okay? And, and don't ignore it. Ask for it. Because it will really help you model where you want to go. And, and often they'll give you things that you've never thought of in terms of product and directions that you can take. The other thing you need to think about is don't try going it alone. Now I know this goes against everything that that entrepreneurial spirit stands for. You know, the whole concept of entrepreneurs is I'm going to conquer the world single-handedly. The reality is you won't have any more objectivity in growing your business than you do in raising your children. Yeah, you ever had those circumstances? They call you down to the school and they tell you this horrible story and you go, now nah, my little Johnny couldn't possibly have done that. All the parents are laughing. You know you've all been there. It's not any different for your business. You are not going to have any objectivity, so you need to have a team of people or some business consultants around you that are going to ask you the tough questions and are going to keep you honest and in tune with your marketplace instead of with your own personal preferences. So make sure you build that professional team around you and use it wisely. There are two rigid and inflexible rules in the world of entrepreneurship. Well, there's probably more than that, but two that I can think of right now. Rule number one, if, if, if if there's, if there's a difference between what you want to do and what your market, your customers want you to do, you do what the customers want you to do, not what you want to do. You let them define you and tell you who you are. The second rigid and flexible rule is that when there's a disconnect between what you want to do and what your spouse wants you to do, <laughs> you've got a very difficult choice there. <laughs> and seriously, I have, I have represented clients at bars at 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> helping them with that latter issue. Uh, you have a tough issue. You've either got the wrong business or you got the wrong spouse. And believe me, I do not envy you that decision. I really do. I'm, I'm actually halfway serious about this. That can be one of the hardest things you have to deal with. I think Donna said before, make sure your spouse is on board. I think that is very, very true. And your immediate family members, you know, coming home one day and saying, hi, honey, I'm quitting my corporate day job to pursue my dream. I'm going to be a poet. And by the way, um, you're going to be supporting me for the next three to five years. And starve. Um, now, you have to understand, I'm married to a woman who is sufficiently taller than I am. So you know my <laughs> wife. I don't think that that would be a very, very productive conversation. I just don't think so. And seriously, make sure that your, your spouse, your immediate is, because you, you, they're going to be living with a very different person. And businesses, even successful ones, change you. Uh, they, they turn you into somebody a little bit different. And your spouse has to I mean, understand that they're not going to be married to the person that they've been married to for the last umpty ump years. It's going to be somewhat different. And hopefully they'll go with you on the ride. I, I, I certainly hope that for your sake. If, if not, my consultation services are available. <laughs> <laughs> at 3 o'clock in the morning. The incidence of divorce is higher amongst entrepreneurs mm. than any other Here single category of people. And there are reasons for that. It is a lifestyle. It is not a job. And so when you change your lifestyle, the lifestyle of your entire family so follows. Mm -hmm. And if you have not put a lot of time and energy talking that through up front and making sure you're both committed to that new type of lifestyle, you're in serious trouble. I would agree. Thank you um, for saying. Uh, Mike, since your wife is in the audience, do you want her to comment on that? <laughs> if she'd like. I mean. <laughs> um, you brought up a couple of things that I want to touch on, and then um, and, uh, just briefly. Um, know your market was one of the key things that I heard all of you say without a shadow of a doubt. And Donna, what I wanted to um, reiterate was this construct of what the market was and what your what you thought your customer looked like in 2007 mm -hmm. is not who your customer is today. And the nature of how they buy, what they buy, in the context of which they're buying it, 
is dramatically different than what it was even, I would even venture to say three years ago. The other thing that's important is prior <coughs> mini recessions that we have been through, if you just wait it out, the old market comes back. In this recession, the old market is dead. Dead and gone. Mm -hmm. Not you. coming back, not comatose, dead and gone. It is not gonna come back and you have to constantly be readjusting and the market is still changing and adjusting in terms of figuring out where it's going. But the biggest mistake you can make in today's world, if you were already in business prior to this recession, is to sit back and wait for the old strategies to once again work. Mm -hmm. Not gonna work. Not gonna work. The paradigm not gonna has work. changed. I would no. agree. T technology is changing everything. It is changing in, in, entirely the way we live uh, our lives. Uh, I, I sometimes give a talk. There, there, are, there are four things you can, you can take to the bank when it comes about to the future. I mean, my crystal ball is no better than a lot of other people's, but just working with a lot of technology entrepreneurs and cutting edge technology companies, I can tell you four things about the future. Um, the future is going to be digital. Number one, we're going to be living our lives online. Brick and mortar, traditional retail service, brick and mortar businesses are going the way of the dodo bird. Everything is happening online. Number two, the future is global. State and national boundaries are going to account for absolutely nothing. Three days ago, I bought something on eBay from somebody in Russia. Now, back in the 60s, when I was a kid growing up, if I bought something from somebody in Russia, I would have had the FBI in my living room within 24 hours, because that was the, the depths of the Cold War. You know, this is how our world has changed. People think nothing of buying things from people in, in Zimbabwe. The, the, those, those barriers are breaking down in a very big way, and the law is having a tough time catching up with that, quite frankly. The third thing is, the future is going to be virtual. You're not going to have big companies with corporate hierarchies where you have to climb ladders and pyramids. It's going to be more free-floating teams of independent people, uh, 1099 groups of people who will picture a lava lamp in your mind. Can you picture a lava lamp? The globs of fluid that come together and they kind of change and they kind of morph and go in different directions. That's kind of what the world of work, I think, is going to look like. Do you love that metaphor? Yeah, I like that. The lava but they don't know what a lava lamp is. <laughs> it's, it's a How great many people know what a lava lamp <laughs> is? Really? Okay. okay. You know what a lava <laughs> lamp? I don't believe, so no, wait a minute, I don't believe you. <laughs> You were not around when the lava lamp thing was going on in the 70s, I'm they know, sorry. No, they came back. They, oh, they came oh, back? Oh, back. Oh, my, that my son was one. Oh, no I missed wonder. The, I missed very big on eBay. I, missed I apologize that. to the young lady. We have a young lady here in the audience. I figured you weren't born, you weren't born when this was going on. Seriously, go on eBay, look at lava lamps. You'll, you'll understand what I'm saying. <laughs> and then last but not least, the future is 24-7. You're not going to have work days and play days and study days. I mean... I work a little bit every day, I play a little bit every day, and I study a little bit every day, seven days a week. I mean, yesterday, Sunday, I worked three hours, um, but I also can go and get my dry cleaning at three o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. I don't have to go on Saturday morning on Black Rock Turnpike in Fairfield and brave all the thousands of people who are trying to kill me. So that's, <laughs> if you have to predict what the world of work is gonna look like in 20 years, there's, there's, there's four things that I think can, can at least help you. The other thing that you need to remember is, as the world is changing so quickly, you don't want to be the one sitting back, watching it change, and then jumping on the bandwagon. You need to be the one who can project where the world is going and be the trend setter instead of the trend follower. Yeah. You want to be part of the future, not part of the past. Uh, there's a famous old Rolling Stones song. You, you don't want to be somebody who's uh, thinking up new ways of making ceiling wax. Uh, it's an old Rolling Stones song. Now, those of you, you guys all remember that one. That's well, showing your age. I'm, I'm really dating <laughs> myself. Oh. That song was called 19th Nervous Breakdown. By the way. Uh, yeah. I, I think the, the, the impression that we would give, or I think they're giving, is, is that everything is going to be technology. And I don't buy that. All right? I, I don't buy that everything is going to be technology. There's still people who's going to pick up garbage, right? I mean, it's, there's still going to be very traditional kinds of labor intensive service businesses that are gonna have huge opportunities and huge upside too. And it doesn't have to be all technology based. No, a lot of those though are gonna to go to franchises though. I, I think so, I think that those kind of businesses lend themselves perfectly to the franchise model. And there is a franchise today for just about every basic retail and service business, Mike, that you can think of. There's actually a legal franchise, believe it or not now. It's called uh, We the People. You go in there and they do documents since they fill out forms and do IRS tax filings and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's even I have franchise competition. I'm thinking of franchising. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll be a lawyer. You think so? There you go. <laughs> um, 
the uh, one thing that I did want to also, you've all touched a little bit on it, um, the construct around technology, and I, agree, I actually have to agree with Mike. I don't, I, I see it moving that way, and I think in 20 years, I think, you know, we might have robots collecting garbage, I don't know. But I can't, I'm not even gonna give that my best shot, because what that boils down to is that maybe we can end up with franchising of robots, I don't know. Well, let, let, me just, let me just tell you something. I, I was at a technology conference in Arizona last week. I, 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 I learned, I, it's coming, you know it's coming. They, in Japan, they have invented a toilet what? that, a toilet that can analyze your urine and your stool samples and if they see, if it see, if it diagnoses issues, it can transmit the data to your doctor electronically in real time to the, to their electronic database. The patent is pending in Japan right now. If you, if you do not think the future is technology, go online and just Google the following phrase in quotes, the Internet of Things. It, it's a term that is, that is being used in technology circles today to describe everyday household objects that are being turned into computers and interactive digital objects. Your toaster being, programming your toaster so that it always knows exactly what your toaster is going to be every morning, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's happening. It's, it's not too happy. Mm -hmm. Good. I have to agree with Mike on this one. I don't know, Mike. I just met you, and I, I, I seem to share common These guys talking. are ganging up on me. We are. Aren't we? <laughs> I'm I'm ganging up. It's, um, well, see, it's, it's you, the you lawyer thing. thing. About all that loan you turn me down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that what you have to do is you have to analyze your individual business idea and see whether or not it has a component that requires personal attention and satisfaction. So, you know, if I could ever go somewhere and sit in a chair and have some piece of machinery come down over my head and cut my hair, would I want that? No. Uh, I want the personal attention. There are certain things in our life where we like that personal connection. And those are the businesses that are going to move forward even in this midst of technology, will they be more technologically astute in terms of marketing and their record keeping and other kinds of things? Yes, but in terms of their service delivery, we're all going to still go out for dinner. We're all going to still need land, or I still need a landscaper, because um, I don't want to do it myself. Thank God I didn't have to shovel those 36 inches <laughs> that I had in my front yard. Um, there are certain industries that are always going to be personalized service industries. And those are not going to go away, in my opinion, because I think people crave a certain level of personalized attention. And one of the things you need to look at as you're designing your business is how do you build that personalized attention into your service delivery of your business because it's a big element for success. I'm glad you mentioned that, and I, I do want to um, go back for a second to what we talked about in terms of knowing your market. Um, and the alternatives to, or what we would call in you know, other terms, is the substitutability of what it is that you are bringing to the table. Um, so it's not just about competition, it's also about alternatives and substitutability. For example, the construct around personalized service versus what can I, do I really need this or can I buy it on the internet? And even if it's a service bought on the internet. I mean, there's lots of services that are available on the mm -hmm. internet, and quite frankly, in certain circumstances, they're better off being bought on the internet, mm -hmm. even as a service. Um, can you all talk to a little bit about, you know, the next three to five years of about the construct of making sure that you're looking at your business on a consistent and continual basis, both from a process and logistical perspective as well as from a strategic perspective, so that people are staying in contact with their customers their market, their competition, and what their own internal resources are bringing to that party. Mike? A uh, couple of things. I, I think it's helpful for any business to have some kind of a formalized program where they solicit feedback from their customers. Right? It, it, it's more than just a, a casual conversation. But it's something that you do on a planned and a very regular basis, talking to your customers, asking about the service or the product that you're providing getting feedback, asking for suggestions, and again, on a very planned and regimented basis. Secondly, I, uh, and you know, just to, to reiterate a point, I, I think there's huge opportunity in business to do stuff that people don't like doing themselves, whether or not it's individually or for corporations. All right? and, I, and I think the ability to be able to identify those things within your market 
okay, that people just don't want to do and are willing to pay outside service providers okay. to do for them. Mike is absolutely right about that. I, I sometimes tell people that the key to success in any service business especially is to find a dirty job that nobody wants to do, that has to get done, and then charge lots of money for doing it. Don't, don't, don't do it for 10, 15, 20 bucks an hour. The only problem with that though, keying back to something we talked about earlier, it's very hard to be passionate about a job that nobody wants to do. I mean, I make my living to some extent because doing legal drafting legal contracts is, is very, very, very scary for people and it's very, uh, it's a negative experience for them. I can charge a fair amount of money doing that job for them, but it's not something I'm passionate about. It's not something I'm ever going to be passionate about. I, I, I do it to make money so that I can do other things that I'm passionate about. Want to contribute something? <laughs> yeah, that's it. But that was true. But, but and by the way, about service businesses, though, I mean, I personally agree with you guys when it comes to personal services. But I think there's something we all should. I, I want to put a, a disclaimer on something here. Looking at the three of us, you can tell that we are all three of us of a certain age, and it's only natural that we will look at the world that way. When you look at the younger generation of kids, though, you ever see a teenager lately, right? Here's what they look like. Is that is that the teenager in your house? Okay. Okay. Uh, when I was at this technology conference in Arizona the other day, uh, last week, I saw a video that was very cute, but it utterly horrified me. It was a video of a 19-month-old girl. It was the the daughter of a colleague of one of the presenters, and this girl at 19 months old had figured out how to use the iPad. She was actually able, the, the father would ask her to do things and she was able to download an app and open it and buy something. And this is a 19 month old girl. But then it got very interesting. What the father did, he took the iPad away from the girl and gave her a magazine. The girl did not know what to do with it. She looked at it, she was, she started doing like that on the table. And when it didn't do, it did what she wanted it to do. If it didn't interact with her, she took it and she threw it away. And here's the scary part. She looked at her finger <laughs> like that and started jabbing herself in the leg as if, well, maybe it's my finger that's wrong here. You know, that thing didn't work, but maybe it's my fault. Everybody laughed. Everybody thought it was the cutest video in the world. But I, don't, I hope I'm not the only person here in this room who was a little that's horrified scary. by that. That's horrible. You know, and, and this is what the next generations are going to be. And I'm really wondering, especially if you're targeting a younger demographic with your business, whatever it is, if those kids are going to feel the same way that we do about those things. I mean, are they going to care about the lack of personal service? That's a big question mark, and I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer to it. But it's something we all have to think about when we think about the future. Okay, I am, thank you all very, very much. I'm gonna open it up to the floor. There's probably a lot of questions that we want to ask and we probably have about 10, 15 minutes to do that before we will cut it short. So I'm opening the floor to specific questions for any one of our panelists. Yes. From a financing point of view, if you are trying to start a business that may almost secondarily help other businesses grow, Let's say, for example, a software business that's going to make other businesses more efficient. Mm -hmm. Though you are not going to really grow your business necessarily by leaps and bounds. It's not the intention to become a Microsoft. Is that a favorable position to be in from a financing point, from an, an obtaining a financing point of view? In that case, the financing is going to be tied more to your expertise than it is going to be tied to the size of the growth of the business. The one thing that all lenders are scared to death of are people who have uncontrolled growth. It's the most damaging thing you can have in a business is uncontrolled growth. We would far rather see someone who is going to methodically grow gradually, well controlled, than we would see someone who's going to do the fast growth. I mean, we see people come to us all the time and they look at their cash flow projections and they increase by, in some cases, 300% a month. And I look at them and I go, really? <laughs> really? So, you know, we're not looking for growth. What we're looking for is well-managed, knowledgeable, stable. That's what we're looking for. It can have small growth 
or medium-sized growth, but the one thing we all steer clear of, all lenders, is outrageously fast, uncontrolled growth. Mm, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Talk to me. One, one to question you're going to face, by the way, with, with any technology startup is, is the value in the product or is it in the servicing? Is it in the is it in the software itself? Are you going to be replicating this and selling this as a standalone product? Or is this something that only has value if you, you install it at a customer's location, if you're, if you're getting consulting fees for, 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 for manipulating it and customizing it to the, to the various customizers? Because I mean, when you said it was, a, it was a product, a B2B kind of product, a business-to-business -business product, just be prepared for that question. I don't know the answer, but just be prepared for that question because the trouble with, with a lot of software companies is that they end up being servicing companies. You develop a software product and then you start installing it for various customers and every customer wants their own iter iteration, their own variation, mm -hmm. and before you know it, it kind of gets out of control. You spend up, you end up turning what, what should be a very scalable business and making it into a non-scaling business where all you're making is a consulting fee for billing by the hour. Uh, and you don't want to be that. Uh, that. That's the whole purpose of a technology company. Um, so that's just one thing to think about. Well, thank you. Thank you for having that, Cliff. Um, yes. You brought up know your business or know your market. Um, how, what is your feelings on traditional marketing systems using traditional marketing methods versus blogs and? I'm, I'm a great believer in pickup. Uh, uh, I, I believe in. See, marketing to me has always been a very confusing term. I'm not quite sure what it means, but but I understand sales. I understand selling. I understand business development. I understand growing a top line, right? And, and so I, I believe more in, in kind of like the old-fashioned methodology. The new stuff is all built to me around, gee, you know, if I do all this, I do Twitter and I do my blog and I do Facebook, maybe the phone will ring. Well, that, that's the easy solution. And frankly, I don't think the phone will ring. I think the phone rings when you go out and aggressively approach and attack your market in a very personalized kind of way. A follow-up question to that then is, uh, how do you find the ability to differentiate yourself from your competitors? That is a great question. <laughs> um, we did it by developing a, a piece of in-house technology that we made available to our customers, all right, which, which differentiated us from our competition who didn't have that kind of a software product to offer. Um, You've got to look at your own business and look at the competition and say, what can I do that's going to be a little bit different that's going to give me some kind of a competitive advantage? Yeah. Uh, I, I, but I, I do think it's critical to do, you've got to be able to talk about what your competitive advantage is. Yeah. So that's right. Clearly. Make one up. <laughs> you got to create. Yeah, really. One of the big mistakes that people make when they think about competitive advantage, they think that they must have a, a better product or service, that the product or service somehow must be different than what's on the market. And that isn't necessarily true, especially for a service business. I mean, sometimes your competitive advantage can be that you're targeting a different market. You know, so when I started my desktop publishing company, I mean, there have been career books for ages, but very, but nothing, nobody was doing anything for lawyers. You know, that was the market, it was the, vertic the, uh, the, the market vertical was what made our company different. Um, sometimes if you're a restaurant, it can just be the location's better, you're more convenient. Um, people can drive to your restaurant in five minutes or less, or maybe you've got a better chef or something like that. Um, you know, in my case as a lawyer, I mean, I think maybe people put a gun to my head and they say, what's my competitor? It's the fact that I'm willing to come and do programs like this and talk about stuff other than the law which very few lawyers are, are comfortable doing. I mean, you know, the, the very last line on my website uh, is, you know, still have questions, call me, I don't bite. <laughs> when was the last time a lawyer right. invited you in like that and said, hey, you know, you got questions, don't worry, it's cool, call me, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna judge you, I'm not gonna do whatever. When was the last time, a, you know, sometimes it's just your personality. Um, or maybe the fact that you speak a different language or something like that. Here, here's a <laughs> trivia question. What three words can you add to your business card that I guarantee will double your business? Free. Three words, no, three words. No, not free. You don't, <laughs> you don't give it away. <laughs> we were talking it about values this. The business. Okay, there are good. three words that you can add to your business card that I guarantee will double your business overnight. I don't bite. 
Uh-huh. No. <laughs> Not I don't buy. <laughs> we appreciate referrals. No. Mm -mm. You don't have it. Nope, nothing free. The word free, the F word is not is not anywhere in there. Nope. Uh, I'll tell you, the three words that I guarantee will double your business say habla espanol. Ah. Hispanic community, very fastest growing demographic in America today and underserved by just about all services and businesses that are out there. Let me go back to your question, and it depends upon what industry you're in. But for a lot of industries, relationship is still critical. Why do you stay with some of the providers that you have stayed with over the course of years, and why have you dumped others? A lot of it is tied back to relationship. Now, not all that's not true for all industries. I mean, you buy a newspaper, it has nothing to do with, with relationship. But if you are in one of those industries where relationship is critical, that can be your most significant distinguishing variable in your market. Which gets back to what Mike was saying is pick up the phone and make sure that that relationship stays. I mean, as, as pedestrian as that may sound, it's not. It's critical. Maintaining relationships, certainly in the services business, is absolutely critical. Other than our teenagers, people are still human. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, gentlemen in the back. I just want to say that at the beginning of this conference, both of you are right. You have to do what you love. But if you're losing money out of it, you'll soon hate it when the bill collectors are hounding you. But if you're taking home a $250,000 a year paycheck, that's something you don't like, you'll soon love it. <laughs> <Yeah, we're not laughs> because right. seriously, what Jim says is totally true. true. I represent a lot of nonprofit organizations. It isn't always for-profit stuff, too. And whenever I'm starting up these people, the first thing I say is, your first objective right now before you do anything else is to make a profit. Nonprofit does not mean you don't mean to make a profit. Nonprofit means the money, the profits do not go to the owners. It goes, plows back into whatever the charitable or the exempt purpose is, the religious, educational, whatever it is you're doing. If you're not making money and you can't pay the bills, you won't have any money left over to do all the charitable stuff that you want to do in life and make the world a better place. So even nonprofits must make a profit. I, people, people accuse me of cynicism all the time, but. Let's face it, and I'm not saying that money is the only goal in life. Please do not misread that, uh, misinterpret me. But without money, pretty soon you're going to lose faith too. If you're working a year, two years at this, and it's just not going anywhere, and it's not, just, and your spouse is hounding you because you're not paying the bills, I think you'd have to be superhuman not to let that get to you. You know, sooner or later, you've got to break even and you've got to start showing a positive cash flow. Maybe three months, maybe six months, maybe a year. But if it doesn't happen, it's going to be harder and harder to just to stay motivated and, and, and keep in the game. Any comments from either of you on what Cliff said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do think there's a lot to be said for the personal satisfaction aspect. I'm, I'm not quite sure it's all about the money. I am quite sure it is not all about the money. No. And um, you know, and, and, and certainly money is important. And uh, you know, I've been I've had the good fortune of, of running businesses that have been extremely profitable. But at the end of the day, it it, it wasn't what did it for me. And uh, you know, Dan said earlier, uh, both my sons are in, in the business. Both of them gave up extraordinarily wonderful careers, making tons of money, mm -hmm. to come into a family business. I mean, took huge cuts in, in compensation to come because they felt that they wanted to do something that they, they, was going to be rewarding for them um, and and they had a whole bunch of different kinds of goals and just getting big checks. Um, I'd be very, very careful around, uh, around doing something solely for the bucks. Well, and I think the thing you have to be careful about is obviously nobody goes into business to lose money. The question is not whether or not it's okay to lose money. The question is how much money do you have to make in order for it to be satisfying for right. you? So for some people, if they can make $75,000 a year, they're ecstatic. For other people, if they can't make that big million every single year, they're miserable. So for each person, it's a little bit different in terms of what their expectations are. Obviously, nobody does this to lose money. But most people who are in business for themselves are not doing it because of the money they're going to make. Okay. And just to show that I'm not totally a dissenting voice, I will say this as, as sort of my final comment, that as, as, as stressful as, as it is to do what I do for a living, I would not go back for, to a corporate 
cubicle for three times what I am what I am making today. I absolutely would not. And that's why people do it. Gina? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, Nicole. Um, we are going to have to wrap up. Thank you all so very much for coming. However, there's just a couple of, you're not allowed to leave. You're not allowed to leave quite yet. Mike Conway actually wanted to just get up and speak for about 30 seconds. One minute, one minute. Uh, we do have about 50 counselors, but we need more. So if anyone is interested <laughs> in learning more about what it involves, I have a little handout. If anyone's interested, and it doesn't cost you anything. Anyone want to be a counselor? Back there? Good. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Um, everyone, can, uh, rounding and rounding the call.